Well, while we're waiting for Reed to get on, um, why don't I just start and tell you what the evening is going to be like. Um, we are very excited that uh, we, uh, he said he'll be on in one minute. So, um, second. Okay, I think Reed will be with us in a minute. We'll start now. Hi, good evening. My name is Medea Benjamin. I'm uh, with Code Pink, and I want to thank my colleagues in Code Pink for being on with us tonight and setting this up. Uh, we have Michelle Elner and uh, Leonardo Flores and Shea is with us to talk about the congressional work at the end. Uh, and we're going to have Reed Lindsay joining us in a minute to tell us how Belly and the Beast started. Uh, then we're going to watch their latest episode, episode six. Uh, and then we will have a talk from Cuba by the star of the show, um, Liz Oliva. And then we will go into a discussion uh, and you'll have a chance to have your questions answered or make your comments or give your ideas. And then we will close out by nine o'clock. So does uh, anybody see Reed yet with us? Let me start uh, introducing him as he says, he'll be right on. So uh, Reed Lindsay is a documentary filmmaker and journalist with 20 years of experience reporting, investigating, writing, producing, uh, and directing films around the world. He's reported from Libya, India, Venezuela, Honduras, lived and reported from Haiti. Uh, I know him from uh, his reporting in Egypt, where he was at the uh, Arab Spring from the beginning to the end uh, and worked on award-winning documentaries about Tahrir Square. Uh, and then he ended up in Cuba where we reconnected with him again as the founder and currently the director of this very innovative news media organization that covers Cuba and US-Cuba relations called Belly of the Beast. Of they've done six episodes now of their uh, films that range from short, uh, about 10 minutes, to some that are longer. I think the one we're seeing tonight is a bit over 20 minutes, uh, but they're quite extraordinary. And I'm really glad we're having a chance to watch them together so we can, or the last one together, so we can talk about it. Um, I see Reed is with us now. And we're so glad you could join us, Reed, if you could unmute yourself and uh, tell us about a little about yourself and how you started Belly of the Beast and what we're about to see. And maybe you could even before you leave us, um, say something about Olivia before she joins us. Oh, right. Um, Medea, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, and uh, thank you so much uh, for your support and for believing in the project and Billy the Beast from the very beginning, um, even when it was just an idea. Uh, I'm um, a, uh, a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. I've been doing it for about 20 years in different parts of the world and uh, mainly Latin America and have been in Cuba for the last few years. And um, being in Cuba, especially during the um, the, the barrage of sanctions um, imposed by, or intensification of, of, of the embargo during uh, Trump um, was just, uh, it was just relentless. And seeing it happen and being there uh, and then seeing so little media coverage of it um, really um, was the inspiration for starting Belly of the Beast and specifically the main, uh, the, the series, which is the biggest thing we've done. Um, which is the war on Cuba, uh, because even though it, you know specific sanctions would get some news coverage, there were there was no sustained uh, 
and no consistent and in-depth coverage of um, of these sanctions and impact they were having. Uh, and even though there was so much media coverage, I felt especially in mainstream outlets, uh, more quote liberal outlets uh, that were critical of Trump policies, it, there was almost no scrutiny of uh, of his policies towards Cuba, and of course Venezuela as well, and 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 and. Uh, but um, it was as if this this unbelievable this the, the economic war against Cuba was intensifying and it was getting worse and worse, and and nobody was really saying anything. So we felt like there was this enormous void um, to and, and that that some this this needed to be people needed to know about, it, and that's really what inspired Belly of the Beast. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to do, and I've um is uh and and i one of the ways in which i think we're we're different and this has been a new experience for me and i've i've been doing journalism for a long time and i myself have been a parachute journalist going into different parts of the world and um and we're trying to do the opposite with Bo the beast so that uh we're trying to counter that parachute model where you know someone like myself from the us or canada or europe goes into a um another uh, you know country in the global south and reports back uh to uh, uh, about the um about that country to their the the place where they're from and often hires fixers you know local uh journalists and often not well paid and um and 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 reports back you know to the us or to europe or to canada from their own perspective um we're trying to do something that's very collaborative where we have um journalists from the U.S. and uh, collaborating with journalists and filmmakers from Cuba, and so that's been the that's been the idea from the very beginning. And I'm very of all the, uh, you know, it's I've I've been doing journalism and fil and documentary filmmaking for a long time, and this project is definitely the one I'm most proud of for a lot of reasons. I'm really proud of of the final product, the series that that we've done, and and a lot of other things, videos that we've done. But more than anything, I'm I'm proud of the team that 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 we've been able to to put together, and so excited about that, about what we've accomplished, and also the potential for it. Um, because um, especially because of Cuba, in some ways, I thought Cuba would be a really difficult place to do this, uh, because it's a tricky place to do reporting for different reasons. But in other ways, it, it's been a really special place because because of that, and because there aren't so many spaces for um, Cuban journalists to, to really tackle these incredibly important issues. Um, and I feel like those we've sort of been able to create a space where, where that's been able to happen. And um, so, and hopefully they can, they can have an impact um, and be useful for, for uh, those of you, and I'm, I'm sure there are many of you here who are very active in, in, in fighting um, to change US policy towards Cuba and other parts of Latin America and the world. Uh, hopefully these videos can be of, of use to help change people's minds and influence and inspire people. Um, uh, this episode uh, that, that is going to be shown right now is the, the six episodes. We did three last year and three this year. And, and this one actually was one that I, I'm, I was particularly excited about. I feel it's uh, because I, I, it takes on this, this, that, <laughs> It, it looks at what Biden has done. If, if last year was very much focused on Trump policy and this year focuses on, on Biden and, in, and specifically his reaction to July 11, uh, and how uh, it's, and, and I, I think it's just, it's so telling because you'll see uh, how outrageous the, the, the thing, his response has been. And then what's even more outrageous is the fact that the media has, hasn't really called him out on these ridiculous um, um, policy responses to July 11th. They don't even, not, some of them are not even sensical in terms of the things he is proposing. Um, and uh, so, and you'll hear from Liz, I guess, later. Uh, and Liz is a really special member of the team. Uh, uh, she's the star for sure. Although there are others that you don't see who are, who are also just as involved, but she's, she's really the, been the glue of the team and, and is a really special person and won a Gracie Award um, this this year, which which is a pretty uh, pretty big award, really proud of her. I ha I, the trophy is here. I'm in Idaho right now, visiting my mom. I've got to somehow find a way to get her the, get her her trophy because it's quite heavy, and was we weren't able to get it to Cuba yet. Um, but yeah, that's um, 
I, I, Medea's, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I feel like I probably run through my time there. I don't know. No, I, I just I wanted to, uh, uh, ask you a couple of things. Well, one is to comment and say, I had a chance recently to be in Cuba and spend time with your team. And it is really amazing that you have been able to put together this fabulous team that, that, act, that, that works together like a family. And, um, uh, you can see a lot of love with each other and the professionalism i think comes out of that and you uh as they told me have been an incredible mentor to this team uh and and uh place yourself as one of uh, the group and it's a, a really wonderful thing to watch and i uh, think after people see this they're going to want to go back and watch the other five uh, and they should know that you've done all of this on a shoestring budget and that if anybody wants to contribute to the uh, future works that you're making, I don't know if you want to uh, put a link in the chat about uh, where they could donate or get in touch with someone. But um, it would also be nice if you tell us what your future plans of Belly the Beast are. Well, Media, thanks so much. This is very kind words. And uh... Yeah, it really feels like a family. I'm really, it's, it's really exciting. I feel like um, it's even last year when we finished the first season, we weren't quite there yet. We had accomplished a lot, but, but in this last year, we've really grown together. And, and I feel the, the important thing, and we've talked about this together, is that we want this to continue even at some point if none of us are still involved. We feel like it's an important project and one um, that can grow and hope maybe inspire others. And so, um, um, uh, yeah, it's been it, it's been great. So we're the, the, this coming year. We we want to continue to do the work we're doing. Um, we have a lot of ideas of what we can do and how uh, we want to cover more outside of Havana. We've been very limited at Havana because of COVID and the inability to travel because of travel restrictions. We're also really interested in in, in digging deeper into the causes of policy, we've been very focused on the impact of policy and what's happening uh, and looked at the causes sort of on a superficial level, uh, but uh, to, to dig into the investigatively into the web of economic and political interests that are driving Cuba policy in the United States. Uh, so really look at the belly of the beast in a sense and, um, and, and do some investigative work because media in the US and Florida uh, especially uh, do nothing uh, to hold all of the, these actors accountable for Cuba policy. And we feel like that's another sort of huge void in coverage, something we can, we can do. And so that's, a, that's another thing that we have planned for, for next year. And then, uh, yeah, as far as contributing, that would be amazing. We're may have been mainly fueled by, by donations. And, um, and I, can, I can put that information in the, in the chat. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We know that you have uh, rare moments to be with your family, and we thank you for taking uh, time out to join us. Uh, and we thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. And uh, we will be encouraging people to watch all of the episodes because each one of them is very, very special. And uh, so thank you, Reed. And now we're going to go and watch episode six of Belly of the Beast. Hi, I'm Liz. On July 11, Cuba had its biggest anti-government protest in decades. Lo sé porque estuve ahí. In other countries, protests are normal, but for me, it was shocking. I'd seen plenty of pro-revolutionary demonstrations. But a big protest against the government? Eso aquí no pasa, o no pasaba. The protest didn't last long, but outside Cuba, the news story kept going. Continuous protests and demonstrations in South Florida. This is a scene at Versailles near Calle Ocho. Para mañana está prevista otra manifestación. Que si Cuba está en la calle, Miami también. People in Miami went crazy. And in DC, Biden decided to increase sanctions against Cuba. As usual, what is said in Miami and DC está lejos de nuestra realidad aquí en Cuba.
Michael Gonzalez is a Cuban journalist. He believes reporters must distance themselves from the stories they cover. But on July 11, he couldn't. Ese día me llenó de, de optimismo, poniéndome en la piel de la ciudadanía. En la manifestación en la que estuve, hubo violencia. La policía, los antimotines, intentaron rechazar a los manifestantes. Llovieron piedras de ambos bandos, terminé detenido. Me tiraron duro del pelo, me obligaron a agacharme, se cayeron mis gafas, mis espejuelos. No me permitieron recogerlos, los patearon. Mi caso es mínimo en comparación con otros. ¿Qué pasó en tu caso específico? Yo estuve detenido solo 24 horas. Algunos de los muchachos que estaban presos conmigo estuvieron en el vivac durante 18 días. It wasn't the first time Michael was detained. Michael is the director of Tremenda Nota, the only online LGBTQ magazine in Cuba. No les digo nunca, esto no se puede publicar. Que creo que a todo el mundo le ha pasado aquí en todos los medios donde ha estado. Los medios estatales ya sabes cuántas limitaciones tienen. Muchos medios que se dicen independientes están en la misma cuerda pero de la otra orilla. Tremenda Nota was initially funded by a British NGO. Michael says he later discovered that the money came from the U.S. government. Al cabo del tiempo hemos sabido que, que reciben fondos estadounidenses, por ejemplo, de ENET, del Fondo Nacional para la Democracia. Pudimos usar esos fondos con libertad. El gobierno cubano no lo evaluó así. Actualmente tú sigues recibiendo fondos de alguna organización relacionada con Estados Unidos. En este momento no. Prefiero darle garantías a mis periodistas de, de seriedad, darle garantías a mi público de independencia al máximo. Y entonces optamos por otros fondos. Tenemos fondos actualmente europeos, gubernamentales. Michael says Tremenda Nota hasn't received U.S. funding since 2019. Yet he continues to face government harassment. ¿Cómo funciona la represión en Cuba? Mm. Tiene muchas caras. En mi caso, tengo una larga historia. He sido detenido varias veces. Casi todas son de corta duración. El hecho de que me lleven a una unidad de policía me asusta menos que, que se asomen a mi vida privada. Información de índole sexual que le pueden mandar a una persona cercana. Todo eso me ha aterrado mucho más, porque es como si invadieran tu casa. ¿Has llegado a temer por tu vida? En Cuba, hasta ahora. No hay periodistas muertos como pasa en otros países, como pasa en México, como puede pasar en Colombia. Así que realmente temer por mi vida no es temido. En algún momento de la narrativa mediática del 11 de julio, el centro dejó de ser La Habana, Cuba, y se convirtió en Miami, y se contó el evento de una manera diferente. Estábamos viendo un video de un líder opositor que está exiliado actualmente está en Miami y estaba hablando de muertos que están sacando por las puertas traseras de las unidades. Yo le comentaba a mis amigos aquí, esto es un disparate que además está rebajando todavía más la, la poca credibilidad que ya tenían. Joe Biden dice que van a estar muy atentos a lo que digan, a lo que piensen los cubanoamericanos. Yo creo que deberían estar más atentos a lo que diga o a lo que piense la gente que sigue viviendo en Cuba. Tonight we are monitoring protests as they pop up all around Southwest Florida. Que los están matando, los están asesinando. They're killing young people. If you're not communist, you die. Los ancianos que han asesinado. Basta ya que el pueblo cubano sea acribillado y asesinado. None of these things were true. But in Miami, the facts didn't matter. Cuban-American hardliners push for regime change y hasta una invasión militar. We are asking for the international community led by the United States to intervene. Are Shia you suggesting airstrikes in Cuba? What I'm suggesting is that that option is one that has to be explored. Siguen pidiendo intervención. The demonstrations in Cuba lasted hours. In South Florida, they went on for weeks. Cuban Americans used the Miami protests to pressure Biden. El presidente Biden tiene que tomar esto en serio. I want to see more sanctions. Pero nosotros somos el 3% de la población de los de la Florida, pero 6% del voto. Un mensaje que tiene que quedarle muy muy claro a la administración. President Biden, the vast majority of Cuban Americans, this great voting bloc will be grateful to you. 
for helping to bring down this regime. Call out the abuses, the human rights abuses uh, that are existing and start pressuring via sanctions. Does anyone really believe the U.S. government cares about human rights? Well, our Cuba policy is governed by two principles. Um, first, support for democracy and human rights. Democracy and human rights guide U.S. foreign policy, right? The U.S. sends $1 billion a year to Egypt, whose president led a massacre of more than 900 protesters in a single day. The U.S. gives Israel almost $4 billion every year in military aid, even though Israeli authorities are guilty of apartheid, a crime against humanity. Saudi Arabia is the biggest purchaser of U.S. arms in the world. It is also an absolute monarchy where torture is widespread and protests are illegal. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia is important. It's important to U.S. interests. The U.S. has given billions to Colombia's security forces, which have carried out extrajudicial killings and opened fire on unarmed civilians. Colombian security forces killed at least 44 people during protests this year. In Cuba's protests, one person was killed. In Colombia, security forces shut out the eyes of protesters. In Cuba, there were no such cases. And twice as many people were detained in Colombia than in Cuba. How did the Biden administration respond? To Colombia, Biden reaffirmed the enduring partnership between the two governments. To Cuba, Biden blamed the government for the economic crisis that sparked the protests. Biden has overlooked one human rights issue in Cuba. He has made little progress in closing Guantanamo Bay prison, a symbol of torture and indefinite detention. If democracy and human rights don't drive Cuba policy, what does? Second is uh, Americans, especially Cuban Americans. Why does Biden care what Cuban Americans think about Cuba policy? The State Department doesn't let Russian Americans determine Russia policy or Chinese Americans decide China policy. That's because they can swing an election in Florida. Cuban Americans can. Porque aquí hay votos cada dos años. Llegará un momento en que el congresista, el senador, el candidato presidencial que no se ha portado de cierta manera o que, o que se ha manifestado de cierta manera, hay que castigarlo. Donald Trump pandered to Cuban American hairliners to win votes in Florida. So far, Biden has done the same. So I want the Cuban Americans to know that we all around this table, and myself included, see your pain. We hear your voices. Instead of talking to the Cuban people, Biden based his response to July 11 on the demands of Cuban Americans. We're increasing direct support for the Cuban people by pursuing every option available to provide internet access. And we will form a remittance working group to identify the most effective way to get remittances directly into the hands of the Cuban people. Even they have a COVID problem on, in, on, in Cuba, I would be prepared to give significant amounts of vaccine. Cuba has a lot of needs. But those three things, we already have them. Hola, ya estoy aquí. Hola. Qué bienvenida. Estás entrando al área de desarrollo de PICE. Wow, qué bien. Gracias por recibirme. Alain is a co-founder of a software company called Pixel Solutions. He helped launch the company eight years ago. Now, Pixel employs more than 30 people. Hicimos hacer que Cuba se pareciera desde el punto de vista digital un poco más al mundo. Alain and his team have developed dozens of apps and programs, including an online music store, a taxi service app, and business management software. Siempre nos han tildado de loco hasta que hemos demostrado que, que es posible. Una pregunta, ¿tú tienes internet? Cuba tiene internet. Yo tengo internet. Hoy estamos hablando más del 68% de la población, según datos oficiales, tiene acceso a internet. Y entonces, ¿cómo es posible que el presidente de Estados Unidos dice que nos va a ayudar trayéndonos internet a Cuba? Eso es una observación interesante. The Cuban government cut internet access on July 11. Connectivity was irregular during the following few days and then returned to normal. But according to US media reports, we've been in a permanent internet blackout. 
Governor DeSantis is calling on the White House to help restore internet access. Limited internet access on the island of Cuba. El internet sigue cortado. We should be looking at how we can expand access to the internet, considering satellite feed of internet. La administración de Biden puede amplificar el Wi-Fi en la embajada en La Habana y en Guantánamo. In Guantánamo Bay, Cuba, on the island to provide using these new balloons, these helium balloons. Tal vez es que las personas en Estados Unidos eh, no conocen la realidad. Hemos analizado varias propuestas de las que han ido nombrando. No nos parecen viables. Se han visto muchas que incluso a veces son hasta ilógicas. Si realmente quisieran pues, apoyar el Internet en Cuba, nos hubiesen dejado conectarnos a los cables que pasan a solo 35 kilómetros de una zona acá en el occidente. Aquí estamos viendo el mapa de los cables submarinos de fibra óptica. Los cables bordean Cuba y no tocan Cuba. ¿Por qué? Evidentemente tenemos claro por qué. ¿Quién lo rige? El gobierno de Estados Unidos. Even without fiber optic cables connecting the U.S. with Cuba, Pixel is thriving, but not without challenges specific to Cuba. El gobierno de Estados Unidos que prohíbe que accedamos a fuentes de información o a repositorios de código para nosotros poder hacer nuestro trabajo. ¿Cómo funciona eso? Esta es la página oficial de Oracle, uno de los proveedores de aplicaciones más posicionados que tiene el mundo, que es americano y que te dice que no puede ser accesible desde su ubicación. También hay algunos sitios que hoy están bloqueados por el gobierno cubano. Usamos el concepto que hoy es bastante popular, que es el de VPN. Es como para decir, voy a entrar a este sitio, pero no estoy desde mi casa, estoy de otro servidor desde otro lugar. Por la parte de lo que quiera bloquear el gobierno cubano es muy fácil verlo, pero burlar el bloqueo cuando viene a acceder a repositorios fuera de Cuba a veces no es tan fácil como poner un VPN y que ya salga. ¿Por qué no? Los que rigen la política de conexión del mundo son los Estados Unidos. Si no quieren que yo acceda, aunque tenga VPN, no accedo. ¿Y qué otros efectos tiene el bloqueo en ti como emprendedor en Cuba. Desde octubre nosotros tenemos dinero fuera de Cuba que no hemos podido cobrar. ¿Lo que impide que cobres tu dinero es el gobierno de Cuba? No. Lo que impide que, que yo cobre el dinero es que existe un bloqueo que si un banco hace transacciones con Cuba puede ser penalizado. Y que hace que no se arriesgue. Dicen que las sanciones no afectan a ti como individuo ni como empresario, pero solo afectan al gobierno. Ya seas ya del gobierno o no seas del gobierno. Si estás dentro de Cuba, estás afectado por el bloqueo. En Cuba these days there are lines for pretty much everything. Aquí no. There are more than 400 Western Union payment points across Cuba. Y todos están cerrados. Money transfers to friends and family called remittances are a huge part of the Cuban economy. 56% of Cubans polled in a recent survey said they received remittances. This is not unique to Cuba. People across the Global South receive remittances from friends and family who have migrated to the United States and other wealthy countries. Cubans used to receive an estimated $3 billion a year in remittances, mostly from the United States. In October 2020, Donald Trump blocked U.S. remittance companies like Western Union from working with Pincimex, the state-owned Cuban company that processed the transfers. The Biden campaign accused Trump of waging a war on family remittances. But after becoming president, Biden flip-flopped. I would not do that now because the fact is, it's highly likely that the regime would confiscate those remittances or big chunks of it. This is both inaccurate and misleading. Since July 11, Biden seems to be taking his cues from Cuban-American hardliners. I want to be able to send uh, my aunt in Cuba money, but the regime takes 20% off the top of every dollar I send. This is false. In 2020, Western Union charged a $7 fee to send a $200 remittance to Cuba. Western Union kept $5.50 and gave the remaining $150 to Finximex. These fees are normal for the region and even lower than some countries. Well, of course, there's not an amount that is acceptable to us to go uh, into the coffers of the Cuban government. You can still get money from family and friends in the U.S., but it takes longer. It cuesta mucho más dinero. Hi, Natalie. Hey, Liz. I'm here at Vancouver. I'm going to go turn in the $100. Um, I'm here in Little Havana, Miami. Vancouver is a company in Miami that offers money transfers to Cuba. 
So here is the receipt. You should be getting it in 24 to 72 hours. Bakuba delivers the money directly to your house, bypassing Finximex. Before the ban on Finximex, I would have gotten the equivalent of around $100 via Western Union. Here's what I got via Bakuba. 4,000 Cuban pesos, that's about $65. Biden is supposed to the Cuban government earning a 1% fee on money transfers. Pero parece no molestarle con que las empresas en Miami cobren un 40%. Biden says he wants to send us vaccines because Cuba is a failed state. We have two main vaccines, Abdala and Severana. Soberana means sovereign. Son 300,000 dosis en el día lo que estamos produciendo de soberano. Dicen que antes de que se acabe el año toda la población... Ya toda la población está vacunada. Cuba has one of the world's highest vaccination rates. Getting vaccinated in Cuba is voluntary. But nearly everyone chooses to get their COVID shots, both for themselves and for their children. Que confíen los médicos. Confío, confío en los científicos de nuestro país. Estoy muy contenta porque sé que es una vacuna muy segura. Orgullo, sí, por supuesto, de, de, de tener la garantía de que nuestro país nos ofrezca y nos cuida con, con productos nuestros. Darío has even more reason to feel confident in the vaccine. ¿Y estás feliz con esto que estás haciendo? ¿Por qué? Porque es algo que hizo mi mamá. Daria's mother, Dagmar, helped develop the Soberana vaccine as the head of research at Cuba's Finlight Institute. Cuba apostó por la biotecnología. Nosotros eh, somos productores de vacunas, de diagnosticadores, de anticuerpos monoclonales. Tenemos productos, por ejemplo, la vacuna Bamingo BCF, que resolvió el problema de la epidemia de meningitis en la década de los 80. Eh, fue durante muchos años la única vacuna de su tipo en el mundo. Ahora el foco de nuestra ocupación ha estado relacionado con investigar y desarrollar candidatos vacunales contra la COVID-19. ¿Cuál es la eficacia de Soberana? El esquema de tres dosis de Soberana alcanza más de un 90% de eficacia clínica, al igual que lo alcanzan las vacunas como Pfizer, Moderna. Yo estoy vacunada con Agdala, eh, pero en un primer momento el rumor que había era que íbamos a ser todos vacunados con eh, Soberana 02. ¿Por qué no sucedió esto? A partir del mes de abril, mayo, tuvimos un bache productivo grande. Duró aproximadamente dos meses. No recibimos en tiempo los insumos, sobre todo asociados a la producción del RBD, que es el antígeno fundamental de la vacuna. Y la razón fundamental es el bloqueo. Nosotros no podemos comprar directamente a los proveedores de, de los Estados Unidos. Incluso algunos proveedores de otros países. Si un producto que nos venden tiene más de un 10% de un componente producido en los Estados Unidos, ya no nos lo puede vender. Las sanciones no son nuevas. Esto del 10% tampoco es nueva. Se ha agravado después de, de que el gobierno de Trump comenzó a recrudecer las medidas en contra de Cuba. Los proveedores ahora eh, se cuidan más. El pico de muertes en Cuba vino a dispararse a partir de junio. Si se hubieran producido las vacunas, hubieran podido tener algún impacto. Si hubiéramos logrado alcanzar para ese momento las coberturas de vacunación que estaban previstas, es probable que eh, hubiéramos prevenido algunos de, de los fallecimientos que ha habido en este periodo. El gobierno de Biden criticó al gobierno de Cuba por no participar en COVAX, el mecanismo creado por Naciones Unidas para que países pobres recibieran vacunas. ¿Por qué desarrollar sus propias vacunas, que además de desarrollar una vacuna lleva tiempo? No es cierto que el mecanismo COVAX da las vacunas gratis. Hubiéramos tenido que aportar financiamiento. COVAX no ha sido capaz de suministrar las vacunas. y Muchos países pagaron por adelantado vacunas que todavía hoy no han recibido. Si Cuba se hubiera inscrito a COVAX, estuviéramos hoy esperando por vacunas. Estados Unidos insiste en que quiere ayudar al pueblo de Cuba y de hecho ha dicho que quiere enviar vacunas. Es puramente política para hacer ver que hay una voluntad de ayudar. Biden no puede decir que va a mandar vacunas y tener un bloqueo que no deja que lleguen alimentos, medicamentos, insumos, cosas elementales para la vida de la población. We know the U.S. government doesn't want to help the Cuban people, but if it did, there are some things it could do. Stop making our lives more difficult. Got it.
let us deal with our own problems on our own terms. Leave us alone. I said it, yeah? Wonderful. So um, you can all do a virtual clap here for the uh, filmmakers. And if you have questions, you can put or comments, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, and we're going to um, uh, do we have uh, Liz with us? Yes, I am. Ah, wonderful. We're so glad to have you, Liz. Um, we talked about you before you get a, a got on. What an amazing journalist you are. And congratulations on the uh, Gracie Award, which was for which is given to women who excel in uh, TV and uh, radio and other media. And I think you got it for being the best online host, right? So congratulations on that and congratulations on these episodes, which are so marvelous. And uh, we just love to hear a little from you about what it's been like to make these, what kind of reception do you feel you've uh, received? What are some of the, the difficulties in doing this kind of work? Hi everyone, my name is um, Lisa Jolivas Fernandez. I'm um, the host of the serie, The War in Cuba. Uh, well, doing that war was uh, really great, but at the same time was stressful uh, because it's a huge responsibility to for one person uh, because it's the work of a, a group of people, it's a team. Uh, but at the end, the people saw my face, saw only my face on the screen. And that's scary because I'm presenting the whole problem, the whole program. Um, um, it's stressful also uh, because it, I have to talk um, in, so, um, in English. Um, this is my second language. Um, I'm, I'm my first one is Spanish because I'm Cuban. Um, and my English is not so good, so uh, I'm trying to be to do my best in each episode. Episode, um, and it's challenge too because uh, I I I think that uh, we talked this a little bit at the beginning of the presentation. Doing journalism in Cuba, uh, being a journalist is really hard. Um, uh, because you have to uh, ask, because you have, maybe you have problems to access. Uh, when you talk about Cuba, there is no racism. It's also white or black. And it's really difficult that uh, the most of people be agree what you are saying, because uh, Cuba is a topic that is really polarized. Um, for me, that uh, I was, uh, I had been working for um, Cuban television for a while. Um, I was to, I used to talk Cubans about the war, and in this case, I have to talk the war about Cuba, and the role is really um, challenging, um, because also people have to say, "Oh, I love the city." Oh, oh, I love the documentary, but but um, when they say that, you have to hold uh, your respire, your breath, um, wait because that comes a bomb or something similar. Uh, because people also want to expect in more. I think that our work try to be objective, um, accurate, um, uh, the more uh, objective possible uh, because we are trying to expose uh, facts that is really important here. Uh, we don't talk about our impressions or our expectative. We are talking about 
our reality here in Cuba. And it's a reality that you can touch and you can feel when you spend some time here. Um, but at the end, nothing matter because, um, well, for some people, it's not uh, all the people. Uh, they want to expect in that uh, we have a more critical point of view against the Cuban government. Uh, we, I think that of course that Cuba has a lot of challenge. I, I, of course that Cuba has a lot of problems to resolve uh, right now and in the future. But I think that this kind of problems is also a problem that Cubans inside Cuba, outside Cuba has to resolve for ourselves. It's not a problem that the United States have to do about it, anything. So uh, I was um, in the series, in the documentary series, I was, we are talking about the problems in Cuba that have to do with the government in the United States. And we try to expose, uh, no our point of view, we are exposing facts that at the end of the day, uh these politics that the u.s government has applied against the cuban against cuba uh since um, the system hurt the cuban people and that kind of sanctions uh made that our life in cuba are more difficult so Yes, thank you. Um, uh, it's interesting when you say you hold your breath because you know there's going to be criticisms from all sides. Uh, I'm sure there were people who didn't like that you started out this episode talking about crackdown on journalists. Uh, 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 you're trying to tell the truth of what things are like in Cuba, and I'm glad you are doing that. Um, I know you were out on the streets. In fact, I met you out on the streets uh, in November when there was supposed to be the big um, the big uh, protest following the July 11th protests. And you were out with your team. You were scouring all over the city looking for protests. Um, you can you tell us what you found? And for anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, uh, this was supposed to be the uh, an even bigger uh, 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 sequence after the July 11th protests and people in Cuba were holding their breath wondering what was going to happen and was this really going to uh, be a, a new phase of uh, people fighting each other internally in, inside the island. So what did you find? Well, that's a funny story at the end uh, because everybody was really uh, worried about November 15th, because a, a group, a Facebook group called a name Archipelago, uh, we call it in Spanish Archipelago, was uh, trying to make a, a parade um, against the Cuban government. Um, people was expecting because, uh, and worried because people was expecting another July 11, um, nothing happened at all. People don't talk the streets uh, because this is a Facebook group that has like a, a very uh, the, a, two of well the 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 young man that was um, in charge of this group her his name is um, Junior Garcia is a Cuban drummer. Um, that uh, was also in November 27th, the protest that was uh, again, in front of a Q culture mister, Cuban culture mister in Cuba. Um, they cover, he, he covered some, he became some um, leadership or something similar in this uh, Facebook group. And this this man was in charge of this uh, protest against the government that calls for a change in Cuba. Um, at the end, nothing happened. Um, I was in front of, of your home on that, that day because uh, 
he, the, the protest was for November 15th, but at the end, he decided to uh, uh, march along uh, November 14th. Um, everyone was, why? Why did you decide to march along a day before that, the day you already arranged with the rest of the group? Um, oh, the group, the most of them, uh, the members was uh, living in the US, it was really funny. Um, at the end, he uh, never left her home, his, his home. Uh, he, was, he had uh, some seem, I don't know if you have been listened to about um, Actos de Repudio, media i don't know how to translate that they have <laughs> cuban people uh, yelling in front of your uh home um trying to uh make an statement in favor of the cuban government or something similar there was also people playing a guitar um young people singing uh, cubans pro-revolutionary songs um it, this is it's a kind of Cuba thing, I think so. Acto de repudio. Uh, yes. So um, you were saying you were outside of Junior's home, uh, waiting for something to happen, but there were neighbors that were coming out uh, who were uh, yelling in the street. They were pro-revolutionary. Um, it was kind of a, a circus-like atmosphere outside. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and then... Yeah. At the end, he never left him his home. Um, a few days later, uh, we can see a lot of posts in Facebook asking for, um, uh, the people was asking, where is uh, Junior Garcia? Please, the regime need to uh, liberate or something like that, like, because they have, the, they were thinking, um, speculating about the life that Junior Garcia and at the end we discovered that they fly, he fly the same day that it was uh, arranged the protest to Spain. So he left the country uh, and went to Spain and I think that was tremendously disappointing for a lot of his followers uh, who really did look to him as a leader and uh, when he left I think the the movement has really been uh, in tremendous um, disarray. Uh, but the point really, Liz, is to say that uh, a lot of this opposition, uh, that, that I uh, spent the, the time while I was there talking to uh, young people like you and got a feeling that certainly there are lots of things that people uh, find fault with in the revolution and would want to see changed. And uh, yet... Uh, people understand that uh, this kind of regime change movement coming from the United States, which is financed with U.S. tax dollar money and pays for a lot of the opposition, creates such a, uh, an enormous uh, sense of um, uncertainty. And uh, is certainly in, in the United States, in Miami, it's blown up to be something huge. Uh, and uh, with all of the problems in Cuba and a, and a very difficult time with the scarcities, um, with the lack of tourism that was a major kind uh, source of income, as you say in the film, the lack of remittances. And Cuba is the only country in the world, I think, where people cannot send remittances to their family members. Um, and uh, with the uh, prices going up, uh, and you, sh you, you showed how people are in line for everything, uh, there's a lot of discontent. And the U.S. has been playing on this discontent as it do has done over the years, like when the Soviet Union fell apart and there was tremendous uh, economic scarcity in Cuba as well. Um, but uh, as you say in the end of the film, um, that it, it, the, the, uh, what you were calling for is for the United States to leave Cuba alone. And that's what we are calling for. And I want to give time uh, to talk about some of the things we're doing in the US. So I don't know if there's any words you want to leave us with Liz about 
uh, what you think we should be doing or anything you'd like to uh, tell folks before we move on to the portion of our program that deals with what's our responsibility here? Well, it's easier. You have to press your politics, uh, politicians to leave Cuba alone because the province in Cuba belongs to Cuban people. Uh, the most great thing that the United States or the US government can do for us is leave us. Uh, because we don't need money from the US. We don't need anything from them. We need only that Cuban people have to write to live um, peacefully and uh, to to write to uh, live or have a country that we need and we have and we desire and we help us uh, because we deserve it. Um, at the end of the day. Uh, uh, the, U the U.S. government say that they want to help us, but they end to hurt us. Um, the most, for example, when someone in U.S. asked me the question that you already asked, uh, I, I already say, well, you need to pressure and you need to do whatever is in your hand to uh, end the blockade and in the sanctions against Cuba uh, and the lobby, uh, Cuban American lobby that is not a Democrat, uh, Democrat or Republic um, is both. Uh, that it, uh, and this is, this is a thing that are killing us. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I want everybody to stay on because we have a big responsibility and a lot of work to do, but uh, let's give a, another virtual applause to Liz. Uh, thank you so much for your marvelous work. We look forward to seeing all the episodes for those who haven't seen them yet. And we look forward to the future work that you're going to come out with. It's professional, it's beautifully done, uh, and it's very profound and very important for people in this country to see. Thank you. So now we want to go to the portion of uh, what we can do. And there is um, a lot that is going on and a, a, a number of people on this call um, that are working hard and doing things. And if you want to put in the chat some of the things that uh, you are working on that you would like people to know about, that would be great. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to bring up Shea Libo. Uh, to talk about the congressional liaisons that we have. Uh, just by way of introduction, um, we are part of a, a larger group called ACERE, and I think we have Natasha on tonight. We'd love a chance to get to you if, um, if you would like to say a word about that. Um, but we just came off of a really wonderful uh, a campaign that we did with quite a number of groups like Just Foreign Policy, uh, the National Network on Cuba, uh, groups like the um, Center for Democracy in the Americas. And um, we all worked hard to get uh, 114 members of Congress to sign a letter going to Biden to tell him to lift the restrictions on remittances, on travel, on humanitarian aid, and to go back to the Obama years where he was a, Biden was a part of that to normalize relations with Cuba. We thought that post July 11th, after those um, uh, after those protests, it was going to be very hard to get. Uh, Congress people to sign on to that. And uh, a similar letter we had before the July 11th protest got 80 members of Congress. We thought, okay, we'll work really hard and see if we can get 80 again. Um, well, we passed 80. We said, let's go for 100. Then we said, let's go for over 111, because then we could say it's the majority of Democrats in Congress, and we ended up getting 114. So it was the majority of members in the Democratic representatives in Congress telling a Democratic president that they don't agree with his policies. So we have momentum now, and we have to use that momentum. And so, Shay, can you tell us how people can join us in this 
very critical, I know it's hard to do, uh, work of pressuring Congress. And, and, and one more thing just before I ask you to come on is that what we ask people to do this time is not only pressure their member of Congress, because some of you in live, live in places where there is already a progressive member, like I see uh, um, the, uh, some of you from Barbara Lee's district. You don't have to put pressure on her. She was a co-sponsor. Some of you have horrible Republicans who are never going to sign on. But what we did is deputize you as members of Code Pink to call any member of Congress as part of a national group. And we gave people targets. Here are five people. Uh, and so uh, it really is not just for your member of Congress, but for helping us to reach all the members of Congress as we divide them up. So Shea, can you explain a little? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Medea. And thank you everyone who has spoken and shared their work today. I'm so grateful to be on and learning from everybody. Um, so my name is Shay. I'm an organizer with Code Pink Congress. And we have our Code Pink Congress District Liaison Program, which Medea was just talking about. That program is a way for folks to um, build relationships with their congressional representatives and more effectively advocate for demilitarization and progressive foreign policy, and in this case, better policy towards Cuba. Um, um, our, yeah, so sorry. Um, our theory of change is that constituents building relationships with their representatives and lawmakers is one of the most effective ways to create legislative change, um, a lot more effective than writing emails or letters and calling, even though that's really important as well. So by signing up to be a district liaison, um, that means that you enter this network of folks who are more committed to building those relationships, setting up meetings, talking to the representatives and trying to push them on progressive, progressive and justice-based policy. Um, so, that may look like me reaching out to you when there is a piece of legislation or a campaign that we need the representative support on. Um, we provide support in setting up meetings with representatives, getting folks from your district to join as well, providing resources, trainings, and then also other forms of engagement, even if what Medea was talking about, your rep might not be movable or might already be on board. There are new ways to engage. Um, so I'm going to put the link in the chat where you all can register if you're interested in being part of this program. If you have more questions and aren't sure if you want to join, but would like to talk it through, I would love you to email me. Um, I just put my email in the chat as well. I'm shay at codepink.org. Um, yeah, and this is just one way to engage, but I do think it's a really important mechanism, especially for those of us who are based here in the United States, the Valley of the Beast. Um, yeah, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we feel like this momentum we had is quite extraordinary and uh, we have to keep it up. And as you know, there is an election coming on. Uh, there, uh, we, want to, um, we want to commission some polls in Florida to look at what uh, people in the state of Florida, including the Cuban Americans think about this. Uh, because uh, they are not all of one voice. And I know we have some Cuban Americans on the call. Uh, if any of you want to say anything, Josue, Tomas, um, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, in the meantime, I think we uh, also want to mention that we have trips to Cuba coming up. I was just thinking today, where can people go away where they can feel safe uh, from COVID? And there's really actually probably the, the best place in the world right now to go is Cuba, <laughs> because I think they are about number one or number two in terms of vaccines. 91% uh, of their population uh, is vaccinated, I think, as of today. And the ones who aren't vaccinated, they le left to the end uh, people who had already gotten COVID. So, um, and they're doing incredible screening as soon as people come in. Uh, it is quite amazing the, um, uh, the care that they're taking to uh, stop the spread and, um, and vaccinate all their people with homegrown vaccines. And just imagine a small very, very poor island being able to come up with its own vaccines and vaccinate the entire population. And they, they do it from age two on. Uh, and I had a chance to visit the places where the vaccines are produced when I was there and meet these just lovely, lovely, incredible scientists who are working day and night 
uh, and now to make sure that they are safe from Omicron, which it, it seems that this their vaccine uh, is. Um, so we have two trips coming up one in February 12th to the 19th and one in March. And Sharon, if you're on and wanna say a word about the upcoming trips and uh, how people can learn about them, do you, are you uh, on and can you unmute yourself? Media. Um, uh, as Medea mentioned, um, Code Pink and Proximity Cuba have two trips coming up. One is February 12th through the 19th. And that's going to focus on the Cuban vaccine program, the, um, the economy, and it will coincide with the International Book Fair. So that'll be the first trip. And then the second trip is going to be March 5th through 12th, and that's going to focus on Cuban arts and culture. And I am going ahead and putting those dates and our emails in the chat. So if you have um, interest in joining either of those groups or have any questions about that, um, please contact either um, myself or uh, Rodrigo, who is our man in Havana, and uh, we can give you all the information you need. Thank you so much. Uh, we're excited that the trips are starting to go again. Uh, and I do think it's probably the safest place in the world uh, to go under COVID right now. Um, uh, we uh, we have Natasha with us, and Natasha is one of the key members of Acere. Do you want to unmute yourself and just say a word about the work that we're doing in Acere? Sure. It's great to see everyone's face and hear from you all, and to see um, just this lovely group gathered here tonight for this for for this purpose. Um, Acere stands for the Alliance for Cuba Engagement and Respect. It's only about a year and a half old, and it's a coalition of groups and individuals across the US who have decided that it's really time to push for progressive policy changes in Washington. So uh, we know that there has been um, a lot of effort and a lot of organizations that have been around for a long time that have focused on policy changes and yet we haven't seen much happen. And in fact, we've seen, as you all heard, really a reverse of the, of the advances that took place under the Obama administration. Um, which was the anniversary, which was just a, a, a week ago or so now. It's been seven years since the reestablishment of diplomatic relations and engagement with Cuba, and yet that feels like, you know, 61 years ago, unfortunately. And so, and I said it, we really think that it, uh, it's important that we channel the voices of grassroots leaders and activists and constituents and individuals, all of us on this call tonight, to uh, the halls of power to DC to really demand the change that the majority of US residents and citizens of Cuban Americans and the Cubans want. And um, to hold those accountable um, who have uh, made those promises and yet have not fulfilled them. And so you heard one of the latest um, you know, victories, people's victories call them that we had just last week with the congressional letter by 114 members of Congress that was sent to Biden, their own president, demanding uh, changes in, in Cuba policy and positions. But in addition, there's a lot of other ways that we can really reach back to seven years ago and try to build upon the momentum that started then, including with um, you know sectors that have just been really quiet now, the business sector, agricultural sector, transportation sector. There's so many that, uh, you know, academic, cultural components, artists that were active and vocal and really supportive of re-engagement that need, have been silent and that really need to be re-engaged now. And so to the extent that any of you are interested or have contacts or have thoughts about how we can re out to U.S. businesses, to um, those in, in farming and agricultural and poultry settings, dairy settings, those who have an interest and want to engage with their Cuban counterparts, please reach out to us. I'm going to drop that set of email in the chat. Uh, all of our work is really focused on how we can push, um, you know, D narrative change and policy change in the White House and in Congress. And so we really look forward to being in partnership with all of you and to hearing your ideas on how we can better do that. In the meantime, when you're reaching out to your members, if you're going to be a part, if you're going to be a congressional liaison with Code Pink, or you're going to be in touch with those congressional liaisons, 
We have talking points on the Aceta website. If you'd like us to help set up a meeting with your member of Congress, if you'd like to reach out to the district office or take advantage while they're gonna be home in the district for the holidays to request a meeting, we'd be happy to support you however we can. Um, and I'm gonna drop the website again in the chat for anyone who's interested in learning more about Aceta. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natasha. So if anybody is really interested, we are all volunteers at Asede, but it's a fun group. It's an amazing, wonderful, high powered group. Uh, if any of you want to really get involved in the nitty gritty of pressuring the administration, Congress doing the sectoral outreach, uh, um, uh, we are uh, anxious to have more people working with us. So you can just write to us at info at acere.org uh, and tell us you want to be part of the group. And I see we have a couple of hands raised of people who are, uh, I know two wonderful Cuban Americans. I also wanted to say uh, that we work very closely with um, a Cuban American group called Puentes de Amor. And we have some of their um, members on the call tonight. Uh, we love you all from Puentes de Amor, Carlos Lasso, who's in uh, Italy right now, uh, but is on his way back here. And we are going together to Cuba uh, to take milk. We just went to take uh, uh, 18,000 pounds of food. And now we've got another plane load of powdered milk that we will be taking together. So Tomas Moran, I know um, you are a Cuban American who's been involved in this work for a long time. Uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Hi, Medea. <clears throat> Thank you. And just very quickly, uh, uh, just some background. I left Cuba when I was seven years old in 1961 with my parents. I returned for the first time as an adult with Medea Benjamin in 1991 on a global exchange trip where I reunited with my uncle and my cousins, and I have kept uh, in touch with them since then, thanks really to the internet. I have, as you can imagine, the spectrum of beliefs on Cuba in, in my family. I grew up in Puerto Rico. There are people in Miami that are members of my family that are could be out in those protests out there. But I want you all to know that there are Cubans all over the United States, particularly outside of the range of blackout that the media in Miami really is, who really don't feel that we should be treating Cuba in this way. I've tried to send money to my family for over uh, 50 years uh, as an adult. And it is pathetic that uh, of all the countries in the world, we are the one that are punished in this way, distinctly from what we do with every other, other country. Uh, um, and I just want to tell you that this argument to your United States friends, to let them know that this unbalance is just not right. And it hasn't been right for all of it, over a half a century, and we need to figure out a way to stop it. And when some of my friends hear the way that we're treating Cuba differently and they hear personal expressions, they become supporters. And I think that that can make a difference in convincing our folks. So thank you, Medea, for doing this. And uh, uh, we have uh, a date. So I talked to you on the radio the other day. Let's connect to see how I can help you. Wonderful. We would love you to join us, Sere Tomas. We need more Cuban American. I'll do that. I just, I just hit the web. Terrific. Great. Uh, Josue, a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker. We are so delighted to have you on here, uh, and would love for you to tell people about your work and uh, what you think we should be doing. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. You're a great filmmaker, but I don't know that you have mastered uh, Zoom. <laughs> you couldn't find out how to put your hand up, but you figured that out. There we go. Here we go. Uh, now we have you. No, it's funny because I did it before to recommend how to move the, the screen and how to change the view to remove the bar from the bottom. If you could speak a little, a little slower and a little clearer, it's hard to understand you. I have a very bad connection uh, yeah. here. I'm, uh, of all places, I'm in DC with a very bad connection in the middle of the city. So <laughs> uh, thank you for, for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to see uh, all the work Reed is doing in Cuba because uh, I was very lucky to work with Reed when, uh, when he was uh, starting his work in Cuba. We did a lot of, of work together and I, I enjoyed his company very much and I learned a lot uh, with Reed. 
So uh, it's uh, it's been a few years since that uh, work we've written. Uh, been lucky to work with a lot of media outlets from the U.S. and uh, try to change the narrative a little bit. Uh, because for me, one of the most important things we have to do and we have to focus is on media. Uh, I'm going to go back to the Obama era where the polls were all in favor of engagement with Cuba. And when we look at it, it's the same, the absolute same population in Miami that was poisoned by all the media and all the hate that the Trump administration brought to this dialogue and just imprinted this uh, negative narrative in, uh, in, in young people even that were 100% engaged, even people that today speak uh, publicly so much against the engagement with Cuba and, and is trying, are trying to punish Cuba. And it's because the, the environment does not allow them to act in any other way because they would be punished by, by the whole uh, economic system that is mounted on top of this narrative. So, so I think we have to focus a lot on uh, having a strong impact uh, on the media. And on, in my, on my side, uh, I'm trying to launch a website called the Cuba Club that was born from a club uh, on Clubhouse that we used to run rooms on with Cuban culture mainly, uh, trying to stay a bit away from politics. But in the end, we can change politics through culture, through arts engagement, and, and even uh, try to engage the people that do not want to get involved in politics but would notice that that Cuba is a country full of wonderful people, that there's a lot of talent, that it's a country that could move forward if uh, this massive food would be just removed from the top of the heads of everyone they're trying to uh, make a normal life without having so many limitations imposed by such a big country as this one. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do with the film uh, that, uh, that, that we're uh, looking forward to finish soon. Uh, but again, Trump hurt us in many ways. All funding and sponsorships uh, fell apart when Trump came in. And now Biden looked like a, a, just a piece of hope for us. And it uh, betrayed every promise he made in his campaign. So, so we, we're now, we have the first IMAX film filmed in Cuba. Uh, it's a love letter to the country and in, in a homage to Cuban culture and, and its people. So, so if anybody wants to know more and how to support us, uh, I'm willing to also offer my help to any effort that is out there from all the people that are uh, here. There are many organizations involved uh, in this call, present here. So I'm, I'm here also to offer my help, not just to ask for help, but to offer uh, my hands and, and whatever bit of head I have left after all these years of, uh, of struggle. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for your difficult connection in Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, I, I wonder if, uh, Marguerite, if you're still here, if you might unmute yourself and tell us about the work you're doing and the obstacles you've come across in the cultural field. Are you still on? Somebody wrote, Josue, Cuba IMAX is stunning, and it certainly is stunning. Um, you can watch the trailer, and it just makes you want to get on a plane and go to Cuba. Um, does it, uh, can we get Marguerite? So she might be busy, but I do want to acknowledge her and the work of Hot House, which has been doing wonderful concerts uh, online um, with um, just fabulous Cuban artists. Uh, and as we were talking about culture being one of the key ways to reach people. Me? Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Welcome. Oh, you're with the bad connection as well. Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Welcome. No. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're with the bad connection as well. I'm in a room with no mic, so I could pass. Um, sorry, I just went to a different room, but I'm still listening. We can hear you. Can, can you tell us you? about can your you work? Tell us about your work. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, we just finished a great weekend uh, series called "A Function at the Junction," 
which uh, really showcased uh, composer Michelle Rosewoman's work as sort of the cornerstone. And the whole theme was looking at um, folkloric and African spiritual music connections between Cuba, Africa, how they've been maintained in New York and California. And um, we think it really has legs to turn into kind of a, a bigger uh, realized kind of exhibition and multidisciplinary uh, piece that could happen at the Smithsonian or maybe at the Schomburg or, you know, have some kind of uh, sponsor that could really take this uh, intersection of Afro-descendant religious and music practice as a way to bring a lot of Cuban artists into the U.S. and also to bring some of the um, really phenomenal artists in the U.S., uh, Arturo Ofero, Aruan Ortiz, you know, there's so many amazing musicians here now. And I think that this could be a way of creating a bridge uh, event without having it be so overtly, you know, housed in, in sort of what other people have seen as sort of polarizing conversation. So um, we continue to try to create these hybrid online performances that are in part uh, videos that we've received from Cuba, and then also trying to um, pay and commission people in the US to create performances that we send to Cuba that are on uh, Cuban television and sponsored by the Department of, of Culture. And the, you know, the whole point is to you know, say people are not isolated and we, you know, we still continue to want to share our uh, love for each other in ways that are now virtual in this moment. Wonderful. Well, we love your work. And I think I echo because uh, you, maybe if you put yourself on mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, and we put your Hot House uh, uh, website in the chat. Uh, and just one thing for those who are not uh, all that versed in what's going on in Cuba right now, there is a tremendous effort in the cultural wor world uh, to malign the Cuban government and to um, create uh, these um, uh, put a lot of money into creating uh, songs and other and artistic manifestations of the uh, regime change community. And they have been very successful in this. If you haven't heard the song Patria Vida, uh, you might want to look it up because it's become the anthem of uh, those who would like to see a change uh, in the Cuban government. And so um, we have to work on the cultural side. The other area is around race, uh, where Cuba uh, certainly has uh, problems on uh, issues of race, but nowhere near the level of here in the United States. And yet uh, those who are opponents of uh, the Cuban government have latched onto these problems and uh, portrayed it as if it is the uh, poor black community in Cuba that is leading uh, these regime change efforts. Um, and uh, so we have to do a lot of work in the United States to reach out to uh, leaders in the Black Lives Matter movement and other leaders in the black community to be working with them to understand how important the Cuban revolution has been uh, for uplifting the voices of black Cubans and especially uh, it, through cultural manifestations. So there's a lot of work to be done. I'm very excited. We had so many wonderful people on tonight who are doing such great work. I'm sure there are many more of you who we would love to hear from and we'll have to repeat this in a, a different fashion just to be able to uh, tell people about all the different ways that they could get involved. Um, so just to recap, 
We have the trips going to Cuba in February and March. There's also trips that other groups like Pastors for Peace are doing, the National Network on Cuba doing May Day trips. There's a lot of ways to go to Cuba. It's the best way to see for yourself uh, and come back and talk about it. Uh, they just came back from a, a, a 74 people from a Pastors for Peace delegation uh, that was very diverse, both racially and generationally. And those people are out and about now giving wonderful talks. So we need more of you to go to Cuba. Uh, even if you've been before, things have changed. Important to go down now. We have this work with both uh, uh, Code Pink or more intensely through ACERE to be uh, pushing on our members of Congress on the House and the Senate side. Uh, we want to go directly to the White House. So whenever you have a moment, you uh, now the hotline at the White House, which wasn't available for about seven months into this administration is now back up. I think it's 202-224-4131. Uh, and just call the White House and leave your message. Uh, and then um, there are uh, constant fundraisers we're doing to raise money for um, food and medicines. And um, that is just one, uh, some of the things that we're doing. So there's lots and lots going on. Thank you, Natasha, for, for putting that number in the chat. Um, let's keep this momentum going. Let's not let this administration uh, hold the entire island of Cuba hostage because it wants to regain two congressional seats in South Florida. So we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you to the Code Pink team for putting this on. Uh, and um, let's move forward and make sure that 2022, we bring some relief to the Cuban people. Thank you. Ciao, if everybody wants to unmute, we can say goodbye to each other. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Everyone. Bye. Adios. Muchas gracias. Hola, Leslie. We love you, my dear. Love you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Patria. Feliz Año Nuevo. Hello, Mary. Happy New Year. Yes. Feliz Año Nuevo. Hola, Isabela. Aloha. 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 Hola. Adios. Oh, the dog's barking. We can't